In this interview, I'm speaking to Jeffrey Durham, a magician who performed on both stage and on television, a writer and now a director. Mr. Jeffrey Durham. Hello. Good afternoon. Nice to, How nice to are talk you? to you. I'm well. Very well, thank you. Bit of a cold. Would you bit of a cold, yes, bit of a cold, but apart from that, no, yeah. I'm, I'm well in myself. That's I probably good. sound worse than I am. That's, that's very good. <laughs> now, I just want to give a little bit of background to this um, in the sense that I don't know you well. I know of you, of course, because of your, your, your sort of background in, in magic. But we've met a couple of times and you've always been extremely helpful. I'm going to point that out now. And you obviously have even though you're not a magician anymore. Would you say you're a magician now? Do you still call yourself a magician if people ask? Yes, not really. I haven't done a show for about five years, I think. I th oh, yeah, something like that. I think the last show I did was the Magic Circle Christmas show. But that was after I thought I'd actually stopped performing. Okay. I, in about 2006, I started turning down television and turning down theatre. Right. Uh, and since television and theatre had been my major sources of income, um, that was essentially withdrawing from two of my my big areas of work, really. So essentially you, reti you retired, that's when you retired from football? Yes, I decided I was doing a, I was doing a, a one-man show. Uh, I'd been doing one-man shows that I'd been devising myself. Uh, for about 12 years solid, touring solidly. I'd done three and a half one-man shows. One of them sort of went into two, two editions, as it were. So it was essentially the same show with the same title, except that I changed a lot of the tricks. Um, so I did sort of three and a half one-man shows over 12 years. I toured, did the, everything myself and did the publicity and all the rest of it. And um, I toured them all over the place. And in about 2006, I was looking at this show, as it were, sort of objectively, and I thought, I think this show is going to be old-fashioned in five years' time. So I tend to try and quit when I'm ahead. Right. I've always done that. And so I decided not to do that anymore. And then six weeks later, I went into the TV. Well, it was actually five TVs in a day, because it was a... a odd little game show called Countdown that I used to do, um, where I was a sort of boffin uh, answering questions about the words, but they, they always asked me to do a trick at the end of part one. So I did a trick at the end of part one um, on these five occasions, and the last occasions I got a very, very, very long laugh. They told me it was nearly 30 seconds and they'd have to cut it down. And I thought, well, I sauntered back to the dressing room, and I thought that would be quite a good one to go out on. So I haven't done another telly since. Right. Apart from odd bits of talking heads type of telly. Yeah. And so what I've done is concentrate on my work as a speaker, which I was doing anyway, around the, you know, all around the magic and, and as, a, as a sort of a magical guest and things like that. And uh, I now direct. I now work with magicians, but not just magicians. I'm principally at the work at the moment working with two pianists uh, and I work with them on their one-man shows okay. because uh, well in the case of the pianists it's two-man shows but um, I found that I know actually now quite a bit about performing and how to walk on and how to walk off and and how to structure principally how to structure shows right because I don't think people know how to structure shows and I learned quite a lot about that over the 40 years that I was a working magician and so uh, so I'm now able to sort of impart some of that. And I work with people. I only work with professionals. Um, I work with a moment with three magicians yeah. uh, and, and one um, musical act. And uh, I'd like to do more of that. I enjoy it very much. And it's, uh, I actually started life before I was a magician. I was a theatre director for sort of five minutes. Well, actually about two years. Um, and some of that expertise that I suppose I had then, or whatever you'd call it, knowledge that I had then, has come back to me. So, so it's very nice to be doing that. And uh, I write books. I do all sorts of things. Excellent. So I mean, we'll come, I want to come back to the sort of theatre direction and the, the, the skills that you've picked up over 40 years in a little while. But 
just to sort of go back a little bit, because there will be a generation of magicians who watch this or listen to this, who may not know who you were as a magician. May not? There's <laughs> thousands and thousands and thousands. Well, I think it's a travesty, to be honest. No, but, um, no. But you were... You were very unusual in the sense as a magician because you were a character magician, weren't you? And you were always a character. You were the great soprano, weren't you? I was a great soprano. What happened was that I was an actor in a show and somebody had to do some magic tricks. And I had been a boy magician when I was about 10 for about, I don't know, nine months or something. And I still had some books at home about three books, three magic books. And uh, so I sent off to my mum for these magic books that were still there. And one of them was Magic as a Hobby by Bruce Elliott, which I still think is a wonderful starting point. Um, and an even better starting point was the one that I got next. Because I went to the bookshop, I thought this is a good book, I'll get another one by the same author. And I went to the bookshop and I said, anything more by this guy? And there was one other book in print at the time, which was Classic Secrets of Magic by Bruce Elliott, and uh, I read that and got hooked. Completely, totally hooked. Went back to acting, did a few more bits and bats and things, and then there came a day when they asked me to do some magic. I also did some mind reading, actually, along the way, and I did some, I did a, I did a street act, um, sort of escapology and fire eating and that kind of nonsense. Yeah, yeah I did that, uh, I did that for about a year, uh, or maybe a bit less in Liverpool. But then came the day when I was in a theatre company and they asked me to do a magic act in a show. And I was very wary of it because everything I'd done up till then was magic sort of as part of another scenario. Um, and I'd done the, the mind reading, but that was pretending it was real. And I'd done the fire eating and the, and the, and the escapology, but that was sort of pretending it was real. It wasn't quite the same thing. They asked me to do a magic act, which I associated with sort of silk handkerchiefs and bits of rope and all that kind of stuff, tubes. And I thought, I can't do that. I don't know how to do that. And uh, the director, I remember saying to the director, I, I, no, I'll, do, I'll do the mind reading, I'll do the, I'll do the escapology, but I'm, I'm buggered if I'm gonna do a magic act. And uh, he said, well, sorry, but you're doing it. So there you are. And I didn't do anything for about a week. I just sort of, I just sort of sat on it and thought, what on earth is this, what, what can I do with tubes and silks? And I woke up in the middle of the night and I thought you could be Spanish, you could have magic words that meant piff, paff, puff, you could wear Cuban heels, you could have a stupid moustache, you could be called the Great Soprano and I went back to sleep. And I worked out a whole career for myself in about 30 seconds. It was quite extraordinary. I mean, it, and, and uh, I went to Ken Brook, who I knew of, but had never really met. And he taught me the multiplying bottles for a fiver and sold them to me. I just had a legacy of 50 quid. That's when 50 quid was a legacy. I just had a legacy from a great aunt who died of 50 quid. And I spent 32 quid on a set of multiplying bottles, new multiplying bottles from Ken Brook, and he taught them to me. And he just shouted at me, really, for half an hour. That's all he did. You bloody rubbish! Get it! Get the bloody rhythm right! And, uh, and I, I went on, and I called myself the Great Soprano, and I had this Spanish. I speak Spanish, you see, so it was quite easy to do the accent. And uh, it was a hit. And so I, I did that. I decided to do that professionally. I switched from being actor to being a magician really overnight. Thought I was in the same business. Got a very rude awakening when I was out of work for about nine months, couldn't get anything. Got a few things, got a few bits and bats. Did a show at the end of the pier in Morecambe. Ended up moving to Morecambe. And just did working men's clubs and this, that and the other. And um, slowly got some some work and some recognition really. I had an awful, terrible knockback when in 1979, when I'd been doing it, The Great Soprano, I suppose, for three years, I did a very foolish thing. I took the advice of my agent at the time and did a TV talent show in which A, I was disastrous because I was terrible, but B, it was disastrous for me. I mean, the, the show was awful and made everyone look twice as bad as actually they were because of the way it was shot and the way it was done. 
It was done in a 2,000 seat a theatre, which you should never do a television in, particularly with people who don't know what they're doing, because we were told to play the whole theatre as if we were just doing a show. So everyone went on and went, hello! And of course, on television, that just looks awful. So every possible mistake was made, and I was then out of work for about a year, lost everything, lost all the bookings I'd had, they were all cancelled, and uh, came up another way, really. Came up the sort of what then was, well, it, there was no sort of alternative comedy as it became known or anything like that. But I did a show in the back of a pub. Um, and it went very well, and, and the show ended up transferring to the West End of London. And that's how I got a break, because the TVs came, and they saw me. And I ended up on Cracker Jack. And I ended up in a sort of... I, I ended up on a sort of children's theatre ghetto of television, just doing, just doing children's television and children's theatre. So how long overall did The Great Soprendo... 14, 14 years. 14 years. And The, and the Great Soprendo was hiding. The, as you said, The Great Soprendo was a character. So The Great Soprendo was a way of hiding behind something so that it wasn't me and I could say outrageous things and um, I could say things that I would never say. And it was, it was a bit of a piss take, a magic act actually. It was a bit of a piss take of the kind of magicians that I didn't, wasn't particularly interested in, in seeing myself. And I did a lot of magical cliches in it deliberately, but I also made the magic work so it was unlike other comedy acts of the time. Right. One, of the things, one of the things I did when I, when I was thinking it through, not, not when I was the actor doing the thing and, and I'd suddenly thought of the idea of the Spanish magician, but when I was thinking about actually throwing over being, a, being an actor and becoming a magician, um, I did a lot of thinking about who the opposition was, who else was good, who else did I know about who was good. And there were three, really. There was Tommy Cooper, there was David Nixon, who was the big boy then. And there was Paul Daniels, who was just coming up on the sidelines. He'd done a programme called The Will Tappers and Shunter Social Club, and he'd ab absolutely blown the nation away with that. I mean, he was, he was... And he did a show called Blackpool Bonanza or something, I think. And I used to watch him and think he was very good. And I was pretty sure he was going to be a star. I'd seen Terry Seabrook because there was a programme called For My Next Trick which Terry Seabrook was on and John Wade was on. And the thing all these people had that I reckoned would make me different from everybody else was that I was going to be Spanish and funny foreign, which you could do then. You can't quite do it in the same way now. Um, and they were all English. So there was no way you could compare me with them. And the more flamboyant I was, the more unlike those people I was going to be. So I decided to be flamboyant and funny foreign and all those things. It's very interesting now, it seems to me, that what people want to do these days is be just like the people they've seen on television. So I was going to ask you actually, I mean, why do you think, because in terms of character magicians, yeah. I would struggle now yeah. to sit and think of, I mean, I, I mean I'm not talking of your Chung Ling Tzu's, and I know they were, character magicians, but it's a, I'm talking about people who are clearly a character as opposed to people who are pretending to be something. Yes. Um, unless you were ever mistaken for being a Spanish guy called Grace. I was. Oh, well, yeah. I people was. People were that. Well, I was by the Spanish audiences. That was really? the funny bit. Yes. Yes, the Spanish, because, because they didn't know it was sort of broken English and funny foreign and all the rest right. of it. They didn't recognise that bit of it. Okay. They just thought I was Spanish. But, um, so what, but why do you think the whole character magic thing isn't... Done more. Because it's it would be completely impossible now. Because because you the whole to, you don't have to be foreign though, do you? You don't have to be a foreign character. I mean, you could be a. But the, from the moment you are a character, from the moment you put on a mask, all the media want to do now is expose who you really are. Oh right. So if you true. were on, oh what, um, X Factor or something. And you went, you 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 got past the, the heats. The first thing they do would be to show a little film of you at home. Yeah. Well, they wouldn't want you to be the great soprano or its equivalent at home. They want you to be showing you showing the audience who you really are, because it's all about exposing stuff now. It's all about 
showing people the backstage stuff. There's, it's, it's, what, what people, what TV producers are trying to do now is get, a, get away from the mystique of it all. But I'm assuming that most magicians don't think that far ahead. And so, do you know what I mean? I, Why I'm, not? Well, because I'm assuming they don't. I, well, I mean, it's an assumption. But yeah. My, I mean, one of the things I think the reason people don't do it is because with magic there comes a great deal of ego and playing a character requires you to completely have no ego at all because it's not you performing. Oh, I never thought of that. I think I had quite a big ego, actually. But, uh, but, uh, but I, uh, um, yes, it wasn't an ego in that, no, I see what you mean. It wasn't an ego in that sense, I suppose. Yeah. But, um, no, I was very ambitious. I wanted it, but, but what, what was... You were happy to use a, a, a vehicle to get you what you wanted. And yes, and I, would, abs saying, yes, and I, it might have been a, it might have been a bad career move. I don't know. It probably was, actually. But I refused flatly ever to take the makeup off and ever to do an interview with me. I never, ever met anybody. And if they did an interview, which occasionally they did an interview when I'd be sitting there like talking to you, I'd never let a photographer in. They couldn't have a photographer. They had to have a standard picture of me as a great Sprendo. Um, it might not have been a good idea. I don't know. It was the way I chose to do it at the time. And things were different. I mean, at the at the time oh, it was an utterly different world. Yeah. The whole, the whole of show business was different then, and it was a different thing altogether. Now people want you to be, I think, a person they could meet at the bus stop. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I remember someone saying to me once um, that Penn and Teller, when they had their series on BBC Two, they said Penn and Teller are going to be great stars in this country, and I said they're not. And they said, why? And I said, because you can't meet them at the bus stop. Because we all know that they're on, they've taken a plane and they're back at home now. And the British want to be able to meet you. They want, yeah. to, they want you to be an ordinary person. And that was part of the problem, I think, with The Great Soprano. There are exceptions to this rule. I mean, Dame Edna is the classic example. I don't know quite how he's done it, actually. But, well, he's a genius. That's how he's done it. But, but I'm not a genius. And I... I found it restricting in all sorts of ways. And the fact that it was a mask and it was always the way, it was the only way I knew how to do anything at the time because I'd been an actor. You know, an actor's, you know, you hide yourself. You're very sort of self-effacing. And um, I found that there were all sorts of tricks I couldn't do, that I, all sorts of areas of show business I couldn't be in. I could only be in kids' shows by then, and, 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 and being in kids' shows had taken away a big element of what I'd originally intended for The Great Soprano, was for there to be some irony there, you know, for it to be at one level a Mickey take of magic acts. Yeah. Well, none of that was, was, was available to children. They yeah. weren't interested in that. And that's something I was going to ask you, because obviously you could do it ironically. Yeah. But if it was never perceived as ironic, Absolutely. then you end up and you will end up being led by the masses in the end. Precisely, yeah. Becoming what people perceive yeah. you to be. Exactly. So at what point in doing it did did the line of wanting to be an artist or a performer or a, you know, the, the magician you know, not not necessarily the magician, what point did that kind of take over the point of being a great Soprendo and the great Soprendo start becoming a huge thorn in your side? I mean it must have at some point been a real yeah quite early thing. really <laughs> yeah I mean I, I, I yeah I was no not day two um I did a West End run with my then wife uh I did the first half she did the second half in 1982 at the Duchess Theatre lots of television came out of that for both of us uh we refused to work together after that um, not for any personal reasons or anything like that, but because we thought it was a bad career move to do that. Um, and I got Cracker Jacks, as I say, and I got the... Oh, all those things. I mean, everyone thinks I did hundreds of Cracker Jacks. In fact, I did seven. Um, but I did a hundred and one things that looked just like Cracker Jack. <laughs> I, did, um, I did three series, I think, with the Crankies. And I did... Uh, I did the Keith Harris show, and I did every Saturday morning TV show there ever was, and I did all this stuff, you know, and uh, still couldn't quite say who I was, and, 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 and wasn't prepared, as I say, to do, to do interviews, sort of confessing all or any of that stuff. 
Uh, the person who's really got it right, incidentally, is Paul O'Grady. I mean, Paul O'Grady was able to go effortlessly, it appeared, yeah. from being Liv Lily Savage and only being Lily Savage to suddenly being called Paul O'Grady. I mean, quite brilliant. Yeah. But anyway, um, I wasn't able to make those transitions and I was beginning to feel a bit antsy, I should think, about it all by about 1985 or something like that. And I remember in 1987 doing a Saturday morning TV show that was to be live from Hyde Park. And I turned up in all my great Soprendo gear with my Cuban heels because I was told there was no dressing room space. Well, obviously there wasn't, it was Hyde Park. And it had rained the night before. And Hyde Park was like a bog. And I had to, in my Cuban heels and all this pink suit that I had, pink silk suit, I had to wade across Hyde Park and sit in a caravan with Cliff Richard. <laughs> and we sort of passed the time and said, morning, morning. <laughs> and we didn't sort of say very much because we both waited to go on and pacing up and down. And I'd been asked to do a close-up trick. And the knock came on the caravan door and the... the the runner came and said, uh, great Soprendo, you know, you're on. The doctor will see you now. So I, uh, I got out and waded across <laughs> this field. <laughs> and she said, stand there and do the trick when I go like that. And I said, where's the cameras? I couldn't see the cameras at all. It was supposed to be a close-up trick. I said, it's supposed to be a, it's supposed to be a close-up trick. And <laughs> the cameras were sort of a hundred yards over there miles away and I did the close-up trick and I did a little interview with somebody I can't remember who it was and waded back and got in my car and thought this is not a way for a grown-up to make a living and uh, I planned it I planned it from 1987 that from the pantomime because I did pantomimes every year that was part of the deal of being a children's a children's star which I was really yeah um, I did a pantomime every year and I reckoned that the last pantomime I was going to do as the Great Soprendo was going to be 1989-90, which turned out to be true. But actually before that I made the transition on television in front of millions of people, I must have been mad, um, without nearly enough rehearsal or preparation. I prepared the business side of not being the great Soprendo and being me. But for some reason that I can't even quite tell you now, actually, was it just that I was terribly busy? It can't have been. I never really planned the on stage transition. And what happened was that I did a pretty awful performance, no more than pretty awful, bloody dreadful performance, <laughs> on the Des O'Connor show, when for the first time I revealed who I was. I took off the wig and I took off the moustache, which I'd had to shave off and put on a false one, because normally I use my own moustache and twirl it. But I had to take it off and put on a false moustache for the first time ever. And I took off the moustache and I took off the wig and I said, this is me, this is what I do. And um, then, I, I was part of the same deal actually, I got a job through John Fisher, who was very kind to me indeed, uh, presenting the first series, well, both series, of The Best of Magic. Right. That was 1989, and the second series was 1990. And I can't watch them now, because all I see is this buffoon who doesn't know who he is and doesn't know what he's doing. Because yeah, it must have been incredibly difficult, though, because all your performing time, yeah. all of your performing time, had been as somebody else. And you'd think that an intelligent person would have done some preparation and had done some shows as himself before he went on television as himself. You know what, I think that, this is just my opinion, you say, why did you, I think that's because you're an actor. And, and because as an actor, I think it's really difficult to be ourselves. I do genuinely believe, I think, and you say, why well, did you do, why did you do preparation? Well, that's certainly true. Because... 
you're yeah. an actor, and you wait. Yeah. For, you almost wait for that preparation to happen. Yes, I suppose that's true. I can't watch the best of magic because all I see is a rabbit in the headlights. I see somebody performing really quite badly. Um, doesn't doesn't even have a centred voice. That person. Um, it's slightly great to break. Slightly up there. It's you know. I'm sorry, I've got a cold. I can't do it. But you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, and it's a little bit hyper, and it's a little bit not quite good enough, really. And it took me, actually, till... Oh, I don't know when I first did Countdown. It took me the years. What was that? Five years, probably, later. Yeah. I don't know when I first did it. But, but it was probably five years later, I should think, that I started to get a handle. For the first time, really. I on you were. Yeah, well... <sighs> who well, you are. Yes. I mean, what you are... I often get asked this because I've been, because I've been, you know, a performer as somebody else and then I started doing it as myself. I've of, I'm often asked what, you know, how you create a character that's supposed to be you. People say, I think I'm finding my character. People think, I'm finding my character on stage. I'm emphasising this about myself and I'm not emphasising that about myself. I think that's a big mistake. Really do. What your character is, and the reason I got it wrong to start with, which I now actually don't blame myself for, although I don't want to watch it, but, but, but I don't blame myself for, um, what your character is, in technical terms, is a rhythm. What I was doing on The Best of Magic was... Being me, in other words, I had none of the accoutrements. I had none of the flashy clothes and the, and the, and the wigs and the makeup and all the silly accents and all that stuff. I had none of that. I was being me, but I still had the same rhythm because it was the rhythm I knew how to do magic tricks with. I still had the same rhythm that I'd had as the Great Soprano, so it didn't work. Right. And it took me ages to discover a rhythm that worked for me as a performer, and I'm doing it now. It's a rhythm, my rhythm. Yeah. Is a, I, I, I talk quite speedily for certain parts of the time like I'm doing now, and then I will suddenly sort of pause. And that's a rhythm that works for me because it enables me to make points, it enables me to show things to cameras, and that's my job. Very similar job, as I think I've said somewhere before, but people told me I was insane. It's the same job, being a TV magician is the same job almost exactly by the absolute last knockings of it as being a television cook. Right. It's exactly the same. Yeah. You go in with some props that no one's ever seen before, you show the props to the camera, you say, this is what I'm going to do with these props, there's this, there's this, there's this and there's this, and if I do this, it all changes and it becomes that. It's exactly the same job. And I found that really interesting once I got into it. I found that thing of it being the same job as a television cook. And I remember there was a television cook in this country in the 1980s called Keith Floyd. And uh, when I first did, and I can honestly say, I did the first ever pilot in this country of a street magic show before David Blaine or anybody. Um, I did a I, did, I, I thought of the idea of street magic shows and I did a street magic pilot which went quite a long way but failed at the last hurdle to get on air and about 18 months later David Blaine hit the screens and that was that because obviously mine was slightly different but what I did then when I was, when I was doing it was I, I, I was very influenced by Keith Floyd because Keith Floyd was a television cook who talked to the cameraman all the time and said, come and have a look at this, come and have a look at it, come a bit closer, a bit closer, a bit closer. And that's what I was doing on these street magic shows. Uh, these street, street magic tricks, I should say, not shows. Street magic tricks that I was doing on the pilot. And um, it was then, and through Countdown, and Countdown was marvellous because you didn't have to rehearse. I, I found camera rehearsals very trying because, because TV companies were less and less able to give them to you less and less understanding of what a camera rehearsal is. And there's magicians who don't have a clue now. I've seen them on the telly. You know, and they don't know what a camera rehearsal is and they don't know what to ask for from the TV company to help them with their magic trick. Um, 
And so Countdown was great because there was no rehearsal. I didn't have to tell anybody what I was going to do if I didn't want to. And for three minutes, I just broadcast to the nation. It was one shot and I held the props here by my face. And I discovered that by holding the props next to the face and having one shot, you can become a star overnight because your trick is in the same shot as your face. And your face, of course, is what people are interested in. They're not interested in your trick. I mean, whether we like it or not, you know. Nobody a magician but a magician is interested in the trick. They're only interested in a nice, interesting person doing a trick. Yeah. And it's the per... You know this yeah. as well as I do. Well, it's the person. That's a great thing. Yes, exactly. It's the person that we care about. But, I mean, I just spent... Every so often I look through the magic forums to see what people are talking about. And I spent half an hour on a magic forum last night just having a look. And they're all talking about tricks. Yeah. They're just interested. All magicians are interested in is tricks. And as soon as you become a professional performer, you realise that it's absolutely the last thing that needs to worry you. Because if you've got a few good tricks, they are 5% of your overall workload. Yeah. You know. I mean, it's funny how I mean, it's not even it's not even a new thing. It's 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 you know, there's the I, I never remember who the quote was from. Is it the first one? It's that whole thing about I do you know, someone approaches him and says, I do a thousand tricks. How many oh, it's Devant. Is it Devant? And yes. he said, I know eight. Yes. And I, th I mean, I do think it's. I mean, I, sorry, I'm going to tell a story now. Yeah, go on. I remember going. To, I was in a restaurant in South West London, um, very drunk one night after coming home from Covent Garden, went to a restaurant, and the owner of the restaurant used to be a, a he was a concert violinist. But he found out I was a magician and got talking about performance. And he said, oh, I know two tricks. And here he was, a performer who knew two tricks, had been doing these two tricks for 20 years. Yes. And he full, it was one of the best magical experiences that I have ever had. I bet. It was brilliant. I mean, because he, he brought with it the theatre of being a exactly. violinist. And musician, exactly. But he just did them immaculate. And it was, it was fantastic. It was, it was some of the best magic I've ever seen yes. in my life. Yes. So, you know, I'm, I'm totally with you. You only need two tricks. Well, perhaps you need eight. But, I mean, television eats material, yeah, of course. I mean, but there comes a point at which you understand that it doesn't matter what the tricks are, so long as you understand who you are. And if you are selling you right, then you can do any trick, so long as it suits you, any trick that works for you. It doesn't matter what the tricks are. Yeah. And, and, I mean, I get huge pleasure, we all do, massive pleasure, out of creating a trick and getting a trick right and getting its fine-tuning and the, honing the detail. And I'm fascinated by props and I love getting props right and, and working and working and working on props. I worked on a trick for 11 years once before I put it in. That's fine. I'm quite happy with that. But those 11 years... That rehearsal, that getting together of the trick, it's still 5%. However long it takes, yeah. it's still 5%. Yeah. So, so yeah, anyway. So, just very briefly, I mean, we mentioned um, um, Professor's Magic. Yeah. Which you, you, you hosted. So, on that time, you obviously saw, coming through the doors... Oh, it was fantastic. <laughs> you saw the world's best... Yeah, best yeah, 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 yeah. Now, for, from the point of being someone who, who had been a magician as a character and then being you as a magician presenting the show, you know, who came through, you know, who really sort of stood out for you in that show, just so people can go on YouTube now, Google it, because there'll be people who don't... Oh, know. well, sometimes, I, I mean, I have to say, sometimes the people who I liked most and impressed me most didn't come over necessarily the best when they came to do the TV show. Right. Um, because, well, for reasons we've all... TV oh, there is that, you see, yeah. I mean, um... Oh, it was fantastic. I mean, I met and worked with Arturo Brachetti, who... He co-hosted. He co-hosted the second series, yeah. but he was a permanent guest every week on the first series. And uh, the first series was a real learning curve for me. It was the first time I'd ever mixed with magicians, because if you're a magician, you don't mix with magicians. And I'd never, ever joined a magic society. If you're a professional magician in working... In sorry, yes, if you're, uh, yes, sorry. If you're a professional, you're quite right. If you're a professional magician, you never work with magicians because you're the only... I mean, nobody but a fool would put two professional magicians on a show of the yeah. kind that we were doing in, in those days. Cabaret style, exactly. yeah. 
So you never work with magicians, you're the only magician on the bill. And I had never joined a magic club. Initially I didn't join a magic club because I knew I was an actor who knew a few tricks and I thought it wasn't good enough. And then I got into the business of being in showbiz and being a professional magician. So I didn't have time for meetings and all that stuff, so I didn't join. The one I perhaps might have joined, should have joined, thought of joining was the Magic Circle. But I wasn't going to join that because at the time it didn't have women in it. And I really objected to that and still do. So I wasn't going to join that. And then in 1989, I think it was 1989, was it? Anyway, so around then, um, the vote was taken that the Magic Circle would accept women. And Ali Bongo, who knew my feelings on this matter, sent me anonymously, but I knew it was him because I knew the handwriting on the envelope, sent me anonymously the next day a form to fill in to be a member of the Magic Circle. So I joined the Magic Circle. I'm very glad I did, actually. I like the Magic Circle. I've, 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 I've had some great times there. I can't go as often as I would like to, actually. Um, what was I talking about then? I don't know. We were talking about the best of magic and the magicians. Oh, the that's magic. right. Yes, 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 yes. So I haven't, I haven't worked with it very well remembered. I hadn't, <laughs> keeping awake. Yeah. So, uh, so, so I hadn't worked with any magicians and suddenly, the best day was the Tuesday. They'd fly them in on the Sunday. They'd give them the Monday to get their breath back and perhaps get over a bit of the jet lag. And then on the Tuesday, John Fisher would put them in a rehearsal room, a committee room actually, and everybody, the lighting cameraman, the cameramen, the lighting people, the PAs, everybody, would pile in and these people would go through the card. They'd just go through everything they knew, you know, everything they'd brought, and we'd get a magic show. And it was fantastic. I watched Tommy Wonder for the first time then and really enjoyed it. The person who I remember most vividly in those committee rooms was Eugene Berger, because he did us a professional magic show. He never said, oh, and there's this one I know, or, oh, and John, I could do this if you did that. He never did that, which the others were tending to do. He just, he just gave us half an hour of brilliant magic tricks. And he had, yeah, with that voice, um, and he had that, he had, he had a warmth and he had that, that, that wonderful, eerie charm that he has. And uh, he absolutely blew these people away. I mean, you know, they'd seen the lot. I will tell you the other one who really got me, it was the first one I ever saw. He came in the first week and did it the first day, was a man I haven't really heard much of since and I don't know what happened to him, I hope he's still around, called Imam who did the billiard balls from mouth absolutely perfectly. And because I had the privilege of being able to do it, I sidled round to the back and I had a look round the side. And in the end, I worked out how he was doing it. I mean, I knew, of course, how he was doing this. But what I'm talking about is the fine tuning. Why couldn't I see how he was doing this? And, um, oh, it was absolutely brilliant. I mean, extraordinary, banging these billiard balls on the table. Bang, 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 and then another one. And he, he had this extraordinary line, one of the best lines of patter I've ever heard. So he took all these billiard balls out and he banged them on the table. Bang! A long pause when he finished, and he said, Tricks. <laughs> That's all he said, because he hadn't said a word till then. And it was just, it brought the house down, all these old pros who'd seen it all before. Um, I worked with Harry Blackstone, who became a friend. Um, I'm missing people out. I mean, there were hundreds. There were hundreds. Oh, Don, Don Allen, for goodness sake, John, Don Allen. Everyone was terribly worried that Don Allen, you know, mm. might, might, might not be entirely sober all of the time. He was entirely sober as far as I could see all of the time. I don't know what he was doing in the hotel at night, but as far as I could, he was the, just the absolute perfect consummate pro. And, oh, taught me a lot. I had a lot of, lot of long conversations with him. I mean, the great one on The Best of Magic. Uh, for me, was the behind-the-scenes one, was Charles Reynolds. 
Right. Charles Reynolds was magic advisor on the show, but that meant that he was, for the, for the duration, my magic advisor. I mean, because he had, he had full responsibility for everything that I did. And he was in the box. Now, this is something that is totally, it would appear, forgotten now. Is that if you have a magic advisor on your show, these days it would appear, I'm told, because I haven't done it for six years, these days the magic advisor is on the studio floor with you as you do your tricks. Well, that's the last place the magic advisor should be. The magic advisor should be in the box with the director talking to the director about the shots and what the audience can see. Apparently this can't be done now because the box is full of commissioning editors and executive producers and people who work on the sixth floor, you know. Right. And it can't be done in the way that it used to be and it's a disaster because I've seen shows, I've seen tricks that have gone badly wrong television-wise, shot badly, because directors don't have the expertise anymore, why would they, to direct magic shows? And of course, I mean, you had John Fisher, yeah. who was the, the sort of... The he's the doyen of, of magic producers. Yeah. He's not a director. Sorry, he's, yeah. yeah, but he's the, he's the doyen of magic producers and will remain it, I'm sure, for quite a long time. Uh, yeah, he knew a lot. He just, he just, he'd seen it all come and go. Yeah. He knew a great deal. And he gave me bits of advice. I think of one piece, particular piece of advice he gave me, which was not to do a trick. <laughs> Don't do that trick, he said. He was very... Um, very restrained, because I said, well, actually, I'd like to do it. He was right. Uh, it, was, it wasn't good. It was the first performance I ever did of the Selbit blocks. You know the blocks in the tubes? It's in the book. It is in the book, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and, and in the end, I got it right. But it took years after that to get it right. Because the first performance of that, which is on the best of magic, is me getting it pretty badly wrong, really. Uh, the patter's wrong. The, the payoff, the finish, the, 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 the climax of the trick is wrong. It's done wrong. There's a man who sits there for the whole of the trick, only to be asked to be sort of illusion fodder for the last 30 seconds. The whole balance of it is out. And John knew that instinctively. And he told me that it was wrong. And he agreed, I think, because I didn't have time to learn anything else, really, because it's a complex trick. And I was concerned that by changing it, I might just blow the whole thing and, you know, that was that. But, but, but as it was, it wasn't really very good. Anyway, it was, yeah, Charles Reynolds changed my life, actually. Right. He really did change my life. Um, yeah, before that, I was an amateur. And uh, Charles helped me turn into a pro, I would say. And he had an attitude and he had a way of looking at magic tricks that was absolutely on the button. So an impossible question for you to answer then. What, just from that what you just said, what do you think is that tipping point? That between being the amateur who's working but getting paid for it, which I think an awful lot of magicians are, yeah, and being someone who understands it, has a deeper understanding of what it means to be a professional magician. Is, do you think there is a, do you think there is a, or do you think it's just something that you don't wake up one morning and go... Well, no, I, I don't think you do wake up. I mean, I would say now, what Charles taught me um, what Charles taught me was the importance of detail. He, he taught me, um, he, in his way, though it's different from the way I handle it now, I think, but in his way, and, and also Ken Brooke had taught me it before, he taught me the value of rhythm and the difference between rhythm and timing. Timing is so important. Um, I mean, if, if the trick is 5%, timing is 90. If you haven't got the timing, if you can't time a trick, then just forget it. It's just not going to work. You've got to be able to time it. You've got to be able to point the climax so that it works. Charles just had this ability. He was patient beyond the call of duty. He watched me mess things up. I mean, so royally, so often. And he still came back and was kind. 
He, I did possibly the worst performance in recording history of the salt pour on this tree, on this show. And Charles lent me Roy Benson's gimmick to do the trick with. I wish I'd done it justice. I didn't do it justice, it wasn't good. I later, as I so often do when I know I've done something badly, I go back and I learn it, you know, and I learn it and learn it and learn it. And I did, in one of my one-man shows, I finished on the salt pour and I was glad to have got it right at last because I think I'd sort of more or less did. Um, but I had to change the rhythm completely, totally change the rhythm. My rhythm had been wrong because it was a great soprano rhythm on The Best of Magic. And I discovered that by changing the rhythm and doing this thing that you have to do for the salt pour of, of pulling your sleeve up, you can, if you like, I mean, this is what I did anyway, pulling your sleeve up as part of the steel of the gimmick, um, by doing the whole thing at absolutely half speed from what, what I'd been doing before, I found it became a good illusion. Whereas by doing that, I just completely messed it up. Because of course, unless you're Fred Capps or Roy Benson, the quickness of the hand does not deceive the eye. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, yeah, I learned a show. I mean, it was just fantastic, really. So, I mean, just quickly, because we're on the sort of talking about TV, and you mentioned the TV. Now, I mean, I don't watch television, magic on television anymore. I can't I find I can't. Um, do you know? Neither do I, really. Um, Unless there's a mate on, I always yeah. watch my mates. But apart from that, no, I don't. So, I mean, do you just think it's wrong now, in, in, in terms of how? I don't. I mean, well, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of, I think I'm trying to sort of get you to agree with me, which I think is wrong with me, but. Um, well, 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 why isn't there, why aren't there any studio shows now? Why there aren't there any? You know, why does it have to be? This? Well, there was a studio show quite recently. There was Penn and Teller. Yeah, and there was the Magicians. Was it called that? Yes, it was. Yeah, um, which sort of turned it into a sort of a sort of a gamey show, yeah. not game show, but a sort of strictly come dancing sort of format. Uh, and a, some some dear friends of mine actually were on that show. So so I'm not going to sit and knock that show, but but I will knock the way it was directed because it was directed as if the director was blind. I mean, it was just extraordinary. I can't, I just, I can't hardly believe how badly it was done. And I don't think they were given, I think they were given a lot of help. And of course, people in television are all very kind always. But I don't think they were given personally, my view is, they weren't given the right kind of help. That's one example where I know that the magic advisors were on the studio floor and not in the box. Another studio show recently was Penn and Teller Fool Us. Well, both of those two formats, The Magicians and Penn and Teller Fool Us, were based on, do you know a good secret? Can you do a good trick that's better than this other person's trick? And with the exception of the Eurovision Song Contest, I can't think of another example in show business where that could possibly work. Yeah. It just doesn't work. You never actually critique the material. Yeah. The job of the audience, the job of the audience, the, the role of the audience is to critique the performer. And is the performer interesting? Is the performer entertaining? As long as they're critiquing tricks, then magic in, on television is absolutely dead. Yeah. And what you have to do, and you've had to do it really for about 15, 20 years now, is find yourself a niche. I managed to cajole myself a niche onto Countdown because I knew that Countdown in the position in show business as I was then and the kind of position that that program had then, because it's hard to believe, but at 4.30 in the afternoon when I started doing Countdown, it had four and a half million viewers. So I was doing that show then because I knew it was going to be right for my career at that moment and because I was going to be doing tricks as part of being on the show, part of being me. They weren't there to critique the tricks. Um, unless you can get yourself on chat shows or on, well, as my friend Pete Furman was on a cookery show yeah. on Christmas morning with Gordon Ramsay. That's the kind of show to get on. Yeah. Um, he did come dine with me, he did mastermind, but he didn't do tricks on mastermind, but he got his profile there. People are suddenly starting getting interested in him. And I think that's, I think that's a great way 
of getting your name about. You certainly won't get your name about by having some smart ass sit and say your trick isn't very good. Yeah. Because it just it nowhere. Takes that five percent and makes it a hundred percent. Precisely. Yeah. Exactly. So if the five percent is a hundred percent, you're dead. Yeah. Because because you're being judged by something totally trivial. Yeah. And and what Penn and Teller did was exalt the trivial. And so it's never you know, it it can't be the the best thing to do when you're offered a show of that kind is say no and walk away. It's interesting because I mean having I heard someone quote talk about the magicians, someone who was very close to the show, and described it as um, sailing on a beautiful cruise liner that was captained by totally the wrong person. And it was Oh, that's interesting. It, it just felt that that's what it was. It had everything there right. to make it fantastic. Right. right. But it was just gone. <laughs> yeah, well I wouldn't know about that. Yeah. It was I mean I thought its production values were slightly odd. It was what we used to call a shiny floor show. Yeah. Um, which is little odd now. You have to move with the times. You have to do what, what you know. You have to do what's available to you. You can't do what isn't available to you. It's crackers, um, suggesting that it should be just like I did it or something. Of course it shouldn't. It's got to move. It's got to change, and you have to you have to be part of the change. You have to be you have to be dictating where it goes next. Of course, but um, but while television is based on copying other shows that have worked. Because essentially, it seems to me the job of, of, um, of, of, uh, of, 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 of commissioning shows seems to me to be in, in the hands of people who, who are uncreative. You see a format and try and adapt it. Find a format that works so and then do it 25 times. Yes. Uh, that doesn't seem to me to be very intelligent. And a lot of the people who are doing it now are less experienced, generally, mm -hmm. than I would have expected. I was asked a bit ago, in one of these shows where they teach people who can't do something to do it, you know? I was asked to teach the celebrity sawing a lady in half. And I would only have, you know, the teaching would have just been a little bit of stuff on, you know, on camera, just for the show, but or it would all have been off camera and all the rest of it, and, and I was sort of possibly slightly interested in doing it, so I went and saw them and talked it through, and we talked about who the celebrity would be, and I said, has he done any magic tricks before? And they said, oh, yes, 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 he can do a card trick. And I thought, well, that doesn't necessarily mean you'll be very good at selling a sawing through, but anyway, okay. And I said, so how long is the slot? How long is the transmission time of this sawing a lady in half? And they said, one and a half minutes. And I said, do you realize that that is a total impossibility? And their jaws hit the floor. And I mean, from getting him on to getting him off, you're about 25 seconds, aren't yeah, you? It's funny you should mention that. I have a feeling I did that job. Oh, right? did you? <laughs> yes. No. Were you good? I am <laughs> in, in the end for it. They wanted me on stage while it took place. Right. And I insisted on being dressed as a monk with my head covered so that I was re and removed from any credits on the show. Really? Yeah. I, I've got a feeling we'll talk about it off camera. Yes, I yes, yes. I want to I wanna, I wanna hear what your, what your thing was. I it was the show. Right, but, okay. Um, Anyway, um, I'm just keeping an eye on the time. But so, you went, you know, you did this great spread over through to TV, and now you're in this situation where you're. I would say I'd say you kind of found a, a really sweet spot with it all now, in the sense that you're you're doing what you love, you're doing it when you love to do it. Yeah. In terms yeah. Of directing in terms of. Yeah. It is look, good. Look, so just very brief, very quickly looking back on what you've done, would you have done? Any of it different? I mean, you know, everyone would have done something different here or what? No, I don't think so. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, I'd have, I'd have probably spent a year working on 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 doing live shows as me before I made that before I before I did live shows on television. I mean, I think doing live shows, uh, sorry, doing shows on television as me without any without any proper preparation was a piece of utter folly, actually. Um, 
I look back on it with 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 quite a lot of uh, with quite a lot of affection because I learned so much and I met Charles Reynolds and I and I did this show that I could hardly believe I was doing and it was lovely and I had fun and all the rest of it but I wouldn't have done it quite that way. Um, I suppose I wish I'd had the nerve to do it as me in the first place. Right. I suppose, but but I mean, given the circumstances I was in, I don't think I could have done that really. Um, so so no, I don't think so. I'm very happy doing what I've done. Uh, when I when I stopped in 2006, um, I spent a part of 2007 writing a a little book. Um, I mean, a very little book considering the amount of tricks I've done on telly and live and all the rest of it. I put, I think, 12 tricks, is it? Something like that. 12 it's routines. Yes. I wrote this little book for magicians because I had a bit of a sort of sentimental feeling that that's what you did when you retired, if you know what I mean. Um, and so I, I wrote some of my sort of knowledge of, of um, a stagecraft and stagecraft for magicians, I mean, you know, how to choose volunteers, mm -hmm. things like that. Uh, mistakes people make with colour. Um, well, I think they make mistakes. Uh, th things like I, 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 I wrote these little sort of. How was that looking back on everything you, you know in making those selections? Well, I was trying to find things that I thought would interest people, and I was also trying to find routines that I was proud enough of to to give them away, kind of thing. Um, I didn't want to give away anything that was anybody else's, so that cut out a lot of the material that I was doing because yeah. I do tricks that other people have originated. Um, so the Torn and Restored newspaper, which I was widely known, even though I've made a lot of internal changes to it, uh, this is the Gene Anderson method, yeah. which I still maintain is absolutely the best, um, despite sort of improvements and changes and, 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 and wonderful versions that have been done since, I still think his is the best. I wasn't going to give away my version of that because so much of it is Gene's and he deserves all the credit and he deserves all the money. Yeah. So I wasn't going to do that. Um, I wasn't going to give away the hydrostatic glass because, well, because some of that was, was based on other people's work. So, so no, um, I, I chose the tricks that I thought were some good. Uh, and I chose various topics to talk about that uh, magicians had asked me about, really, I suppose, yeah. over the years. And so I chose... I think it was 11 topics to write little little pieces about, about a couple of thousand, three thousand words on each, nothing much really. Uh, and the book sold very well, really well, I'm amazed actually. It's out of print it's now. It's a fantastic book. Thank you. But I was, uh, I was, it's out of print now, um, but uh, I'm very glad that I did it. And uh, yeah, then I'm, 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 I'm trying to work with people. I like working with musicians a lot. Both my kids are musicians, professional musicians. And... Um, I'm musical and I probably know more about music than I do about magic, I should think. I love, I, love, I love watching the professionalism of musicians and the way musicians rehearse and the amount of work they do. Um, I'm always astonished. Are you then? <laughs> yeah, I am. Yeah, I absolutely am. Yeah. So, uh, so looking at magicians in terms of, because you now coach magicians, or yes, you work with magicians, so I don't, don't coach don't magicians coach, sorry, and I don't work with them by and large, yeah. unless they specifically ask me to, I don't work with them on the method, on the modus operandi of what they're doing. I'm assuming they're good magicians, it's you know, the it's, the, it's, it's, the, it's the presentation, it's where you stand, it's points of safety on a stage, there are various points of safety on a stage, but some of them combine safety with hiding, <laughs> and, and a lot of magicians do these these places to hide on a stage and um i know about how to do that and uh and it works for close up as well actually there are places of safety there are there are there are ways of of actually presenting yourself to a group of people that will put you in charge of the group rather than the trick or whatever it may be so i work with magicians on all that kind of stuff and um yeah, yeah. I mean, I love it. I, I, I really enjoy it. Working with the musicians has been absolutely fantastic because I admire so much what they do. And we work so hard. I mean, the amount of rehearsal. Someone, I, I, I won't say who it was, um, but somebody uh, said at a, at a meeting of the Magic Circle fairly recently, um, this props a lot of work to put together. It'll take you a long time about three hours. 
And I thought, if you think three hours is a long time, then you've never had a job. I mean, you should be working on your material, and I'm not talking about amateurs here, of course, but you should be working on your material, obviously, from nine till five. I mean, it's just absolutely obvious. Why wouldn't you do that if you're a professional? And you should be working on it and working on it and working on it until you get it right. And I used to spend... Torn and Restored newspaper actually is a case in point because so many people say, oh, well, I would never do that method, whatever method it may be, I'd never do that method because it's a lot of trouble. What's the matter with it being a lot of trouble? Why not take a lot of trouble? And in fact, there's a, a great maxim, which you know, Lots of us know, which is that if a trick's a lot of trouble, for reasons already discussed, you'll be on your own with it. And the classic example of that is tricks with liquid. If I could say one thing, I suppose, to an up-and-coming pro magician, it would be put a trick with liquid into everything you do because they will always go twice as well as tricks without liquid. And the reason for that is that ordinary people who don't know anything about magic know that it's all done with palming and they know that you can't palm a glass of water. You can't palm liquid. So I used to do the rice bowls and the hydrostatic glass and all this stuff. And magicians don't do it because you have to go and find a tap at the venue. And that's trouble. Yeah. So... It, I all I really I mean liquid tricks have been the making of me. I've 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 got more out of liquid tricks um, than probably any other genre of trick, because I've always known and and if an audience will all your job as a magician is to get what about one gasp audible gasp every minute minute and a half something like that that's your job. Well, the gasp you get on a liquid trick is twice the gasp you get on anything else. If you do a hydrostatic glass, used to do a hydrostatic glass, still do occasionally when I work, you know, bits and bobs, um, with a four pint, huge, great thing. And the waterfall that that creates is just amazing. And it just makes people applaud. They just love it. And they can't understand how you could possibly have manipulated that water. The rice bowls used to get a gar Anyway, yeah. I'll shut up. Rice bowls, brilliant, brilliant trick. It is, um, it is, great trick. A uh, very, very yeah, undervalued. Written, that's written up in the book. Yes, it is. And it's interesting when people talk to me about the book, the tricks in the book, because I get a lot of emails, you know, it's very nice to get the emails. Um, they talk about all sorts of tricks in the book, mainly the, the Himba ring, I think. Which is the one I can't take you about. Yeah, it is. Yeah, the Himba ring is a great routine and, and uh, it's been very good to me. But the one that surprised me that people don't really talk about at all is the rice bowls because it's probably about the best trick in the book. Um, and it used to get absolute gasps when I did it. Uh, the water Monty was another one I used to do. You know, three glasses of water. Um, where is it? Um, we went about where is it? It's all in the wrong place. Uh, which I used to do with, with carrot juice to, so it would show. And uh, I devised various ways of my own for doing that. That's another one, you know, how can you be manipulating, if it's a ball, if it's a three ball Monty or a three yeah. card Monty, we understand that magicians have various odd arcane ways of doing this stuff. But if it's water, how's that bloke doing that with that water? It really is, it's a, it's a, good, it's a good tip, I think. And, and putting, putting the flashy trick, I've got, I mean, I could go on and on and on about running orders. Yeah. But I mean, the flashy think, trick I, at the I, end. We're going to run out of time. But I, All right. I, I, it's only because I, I wish I got into the one-man show thing, because that's something, obviously, you know a great deal about, creating a one-man show. I mean, I think that's an area that people just don't do enough of. I certainly wish I did more of it, but it, it's the effort you kind of think. Because there's, there's a lot of unpaid work. It's not work, that bad, actually. There's a lot of unpaid work goes into a one-man show, isn't there, initially? Yeah, that's kind of... <laughs> yes, there is, but you can cut corners. You can actually cut corners with that. Yeah. Uh, you don't want me to go into it, do you? Because well, you haven't no, got I time. Do. I'd, I'd love you to go into it, but I, it's your time as well. Yeah, so, well, that's all right. It's a, it's a long... Maybe another interview in a, 
Maybe it's a, it's a, it's an interesting it's an interesting process. There's a book there and you keep yeah, it probably is, yeah, yeah. Putting together a one man show is a very interesting process, and um, yes, I do know a lot about it. I don't know more about it than Darren Brown. Yeah. Um, I don't know more about it than all sorts of other people who've done great one man shows. But I had a way of doing it that worked for me and worked for the audiences yeah. and got me rebooked. Actually, I mean that was the main thing was pleasing the theatre managers, and I did learn how to do that. Um, yeah, one man show. They're a great. They're a great way of doing it. Very honest way of making a living. Actually, yeah. You put up a poster, and if enough people come, you get a percentage of their gate money, and that's it. End of story. And I think now it's actually a great time to do it in the sense that you can work off the back of the success of Magic Sounds on TV. Yes. Even without actually ever being on TV. Oh, absolutely. So, yes, absolutely. I've got a feeling that there are magicians who could do one man shows and could get booked by managers if they knew how to do it, if they knew what they were doing with a one-man show, and cut down their overheads, made sure, there are certain basic rules, the first rule of a one-man show, I always used to think, is never do a trick that won't fit in the car. Never do a trick that increases your overheads. If you're having to buy a car or hire a van, or something like that, don't do the trick. Make sure it's completely restricted by your physical circumstances and what you can do, because the, the profit margins are quite tight. So you have to be quite careful as a business person to, to get those kinds of things right. But if you can get those right, and if you can get the structure of it right, it's the structure. Running orders are my great thing. I mean, I, you know, yeah. I talk about running orders till the cows come out, because you can ruin a good series of tricks, a good series of, of, of bits of material with the wrong running order. Um, and I see a lot of that, a lot of that. But, uh, but yeah, it's, um, it's been a great 40 years, you know. And there's a really great way to end it. Thank you very much for your time. Pleasure. Thank you for everything you've done oh, over you. the last 40 years. <laughs> the book, which is fantastic. And if anyone is listening and hasn't got a copy, you can find a copy. There's, I think there's one at the moment, at the time we're speaking, on abebooks.com, somebody told oh, me, yeah. which is the second-hand site. Right. Uh, but it, it is sold out, as far as I know, everywhere. Yeah. There may be the odd magic shop in America, it would have to be. Uh, but the big outlets in America, the, the Viking Magics and the H&R Books and all those, cool. they've, all, they've, they've all gone. Yeah. Well, I'm right excited to talk. It's a wonderful book. Thank, Thank you. you very much indeed for your time. Thanks a lot. A huge thanks to Jeffrey for inviting me to his home to speak to him. And if you've enjoyed this, remember you can find more interviews at www.magicstateofmind.com or you can subscribe to the podcast at iTunes. And please remember to leave your comments. It makes me feel loved.